If you enjoy sports, if you enjoy culture, if you enjoy a safe place to live, uh, if you enjoy a, a place that has a certain amount of, um, of uh, sense that uh, of, uh, of being in a cosmopolitan type of area without the uh, the price you pay for some of the larger cosmopolitan areas, then Louisville is not a bad place to live. My hometown is a river town. At least that's how it all started. We're located at the falls of the Ohio River, so people heading west by boat didn't have much choice but to stop here. Enough stop that by 1850, we were the 10th largest city in the United States. Louisvillians are cautious people. They're, they're, uh, they're cautious about new ideas and they're cautious about change, but a lot of that roots to their traditions. The fact that it is an old community that goes back and has been characterized in the past as uh, sort of the Boston of the South. Boston of the South? Well, people in a river town tend to feel a sense of destiny. But over the years, the river became less important to us and to travelers. Today, we're the 47th ranked TV market in the United States. Now we're trying to figure another way of getting people to stop here. The people are sentimental. Uh, I go out to the Kentucky Derby each year and there's 100,000 people out there. And the tears in the eyes of people when they start singing my old Kentucky home. A landmark is one way of getting people to take notice. And when it comes to landmarks, we've got one of the best. But it's all about a horse race that takes a little more than two minutes on the first Saturday in May. The feeling is that to keep up with other cities in the region, you need something a little more full time. And I think some of those other cities, Nashville and the like, they've, they've begun to peak. They've begun to, to max out with their development and there seems to be a sense that now maybe it's Louisville's turn. This marks the end of four years of work and four years of talk and four years of a lot of fun for a very large number of people. And this will be the first race of the Louisville new toy clock. <laughs> In 1977, a clock sculpture that was large and designed to entertain seemed like the answer we'd been looking for. So the Derby clock was installed on the River City Mall and we hoped for the best. But the Derby clock had some mechanical problems and the upkeep was more complicated than expected. Then it had to make way for the Galleria, a development aimed at luring shoppers back downtown. Then the Derby clock was moved off the River City Mall, which by that time was called Fourth Avenue. It wound up in an amusement park, and now, well, it's being stored in a warehouse for safekeeping. But as I said before, my hometown is a river town, so why not have a landmark in the water? Which brings us to the Falls Fountain, Louisville's landmark of the 80s. This is the story of how the Louisville Falls Fountain came to be and what it has become. Well, you know, we were in Geneva, oh, many years before the fountain, and we were both so impressed by the wonderful jet in the lake, you know. It goes up, it's not as tall as our fountain, but it's very beautiful, and it's somehow uh, very, uh, loved it he, he and he, we looked at it a lot and he said then wouldn't it be wonderful to have something like that at home now that's american we see something in europe admire it and then we want to bring it home and it's just like mary and barry bingham to want something nice for their city barry bingham senior certainly was um, one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent, citizen in Louisville and was always involved in every civic project of, of any consequence that went on probably in the last 40 years. So that's how it all began. The Bingham said, let's have a fountain like Geneva's in Louisville. Louisville is a pretty fair baseball town. 
We actually had a major league team up until 1899. In fact, our team was part of the only World Series that ended in a tie. The deciding game was snowed out, and they just never got around to replaying it. Then we had a minor league team, the Colonels. But we lost them to Pawtucket in 1972. So in 1983, when the Redbirds moved to town, they immediately became one of the community's bright spots. In no time, minor league attendance records were being set. Dan Ulmer is the man largely credited with bringing the Redbirds to town. Banker, sportsman, civic leader. In the 1980s, when you wanted something done, he was the man to see. He liked the idea of a fountain in the river, too. Well, it really came out of my being chairman of the Louisville Central Area Downtown Development Group. And the board and, and I and the, and the staff decided that we wanted to do something significant during that particular time. My hometown's leaders are always looking for ways to pump life into the downtown area. Like the downtowns of most American cities, it needs help. We had a, an architectural critic come to Louisville at our newspaper's expense and critique the downtown. Her uh, assessment was that we had a lot of interesting buildings and that we had lots of uh, interesting activity, but that there were too many empty spaces, too many holes. If, uh, if you want to, you can live in the east end of Louisville and, and work in the east end of Louisville and never go downtown and never see the West End. And uh, basically, it's like living in, uh, in some new uh, subdivision city that has nothing whatever to do with Louisville. It's possible to do that, and I think uh, increasing numbers of people really are doing that. Uh, the East End stays out in the East, South End stays in the South, West End stays in the West, and nobody comes downtown. Downtown has been struggling for years. It seems that for every year of struggle, a new solution has been tried. And we, 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 and we cast about for a, a, a project that would be a landmark project, something significant, something grand, really. Um, 20 years ago, people had talked about a, a magnificent fountain in the river. And I remembered that. I got the old clippings out, and we talked about it. I knew that Mr. Bingham shared uh, my goal and dream of having something like that in the river. And so I went to him with the idea, and he enthusiastically endorsed it. And that, of course, took care of the funding of the, of the fountain. It not only took care of the funding, but since Mr. Bingham owned the largest newspaper in the state, and Dan Omer ran one of the largest banks, it guaranteed that this project was going to happen in a big way. We knew what the objective was, which was to primarily let the community know about the fountain and to draw their attention to it, and to, if possible, get some positive publicity for the city using the fountain as a, as a, um, as a hook for um, national media attention, which is something the city is always looking for for economic development purposes, for uh, tourism industry purposes. The media, locally and in some cases nationally, reacted enthusiastically to the advanced publicity. One Courier Journal columnist wrote, the fountain is aimed at doing for Louisville what the arch did for St. Louis, bring it unmistakable class, nationwide identity, and oh yeah, tourists bearing money. On a clear day or night, you'll be able to see the fountain's feathery plume from miles away on Interstate 64, Interstate 65, and Interstate 71. That sounds great, but then dreaming of a greater Louisville has seldom been our problem. When leaders commissioned the Derby Clock, remember the Derby Clock? Here's what they told the artist. They said, uh what we're looking for in a design to go downtown is something that, that, that says Louisville, Kentucky. You're in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and they 
actually used the words, we, we wanted to strong enough to bring people off the expressway to come see it. The expressway? He means the interstate highways that dissect Louisville's downtown. In particular, he means I-64. That's the interstate that was built along the riverfront in the 1960s, the one that created a very effective barrier between the river and the rest of the community. Now, at first, that didn't seem to be a problem because Louisville's riverfront in the 50s and 60s wasn't what we might today call user-friendly. But as time went by, other cities with equally rough waterfronts began to rebuild theirs with good results. Maybe we could too. An attraction like the largest water-based fountain in the world just might be the catalyst to do it. It was worth a try. What has 41 nozzles, 1,250 horsepower, and weighs 200 tons? Well, you're looking at it right now. It's the Louisville Falls Fountain. And in just 40 minutes, the thousands of people who have gathered on the land, on sea, and on the bridge will see the official dedication of the Louisville Falls Fountain. The evening of the dedication of the fountain was a very highly promoted event. Charles Corralt was here. We had national television. We had the Louisville Orchestra. It was a wonderful evening. I mean, it was a great evening for the community. It was a uh, much like a Derby Festival event, it was a coming together of the community to celebrate something good and certainly to honor uh, a family and a man who had done so much for the, for the community. Of course, there might be just a sad point tonight in that Barry Bingham Sr. could not be here tonight. He passed away on Monday at the age of 82 after brain cancer, but I know that it was a dream of his to make sure that Louisville had a signature, um, a very important mark to the world of why the river is so important to Louisville. And that's sort of what this is all about. Some of the people just, just thankful that there is this big celebration tonight and that fountain will be spouting off at around 8.40. Barry Bingham Jr. was there. He agreed to push the button that would ignite the liftoff of the world's largest water-based fountain. Speeches were made. And then Barry Bingham Jr. pushed the button and and, well, there were varied reactions to opening night. For example, here's what the story in the Courier Journal said the next morning. In a spectacular eruption of water and light, the 400-foot-tall Louisville Falls Fountain rose up from the falls of the Ohio last night and assumed a majestic place in the skyline of Louisville and southern Indiana. Motorists on Interstate 64 looked on in slack-jawed amazement. The mayor of Jeffersonville, Indiana, Dale Orem, called the fountain one of the great wonders of the world. Let's get some reaction from the Indiana side of the river. What do you think so far? I found it very impressive. I've got a friend coming in from Kansas on Labor Day weekend. It's going to be one of the first things I'm going to show her. It's uh, definitely the tourist attraction of the Louisville area. What do you think of the fountain so far? I thought it was great. What's your favorite color? Purple. Purple. It really is going purple right now. What did you think about it when it first came on? I thought it was very beautiful. Did you really? Was it what you thought it would be? Yes. Okay. Let's ask this fella back here. What did you think of it, sir? Oh, I think it's beautiful. It just looked like a, a shooting star that was in place, but all those little sparkles going out from it, just beautiful, really. Let's talk to you back here. Sir, what did you think about everything when it first went off? Really nice, really nice. It is really nice. Do you think it's going to do for Louisville what, say, the St. Louis Arch did? They did a great job. Oh, they sure did. And it's interesting. Every time the color changes, the crowd goes, ooh, ah. Hey, why don't we all give a cheer for the fountain that they can hear on the other side of the river? Let's hear it for the fountain. All in all, not a bad beginning. Birds go south in the winter. The Falls Fountain goes to Utica, Indiana for storage. It's been almost four years since all the commotion of opening night. I don't think it's being unduly critical to say that expectations such as worldwide acclaim and increased tourism, well, they've not been realized. We get calls about people wanting to come to Louisville for the Derby or for the Dogwood Festivals or, you know, an Audubon Park at Derby time and different things. But we've never gotten a call about anyone coming to see the, the uh, fountain. I just think people look at it and they go, oh, that's nice. But I would not say it's a drawing card in terms of bringing people to Louisville. Not like 
fountains in other cities, you know, like in Rome or some of the cities where they're, where they're well known. No, the fountain hasn't become too well known. Some say it's because it's in storage six months out of the year. Maybe so, but then look at Old Faithful. It only goes off every hour or so. Lasts maybe five minutes and then it's just a hole in the ground until it goes off again. So you figure Old Faithful might be in operation maybe 700 hours a year, tops. Well, the Falls Fountain operates six months a year, 15 hours a day nonstop. That's 2,700 hours a year. And it's four times as high as Old Faithful. Still, the reviews on the fountain since opening night have become decidedly mixed. Oh, I love the fountain. I love, I love the fountain. It, uh, it gives us a, a logo. I've seen it, you know, and I, it's, it's pretty as far as I can see, but um, I think it's a terrible, dirty, polluted place. I think it was a waste no. of money, to tell you the truth. No. <laughs> I don't have any feelings about it at all. It's too bad it can't be kept up. It's very expensive, I understand. Uh, I like it. I mean, it's it's nice. Well, <laughs> it it appears to be a white elephant. From, to most people I talk, it appears to be a white elephant. I think over time, people will uh, will will come to like the fountain better and better. Uh, Not exactly hail to the landmark, is it? But you know, it was never planned for the fountain to be a year-round attraction. The winter water of the Ohio River is just too full of debris. It's also subject to the occasional freeze. But the truth be known, the problem is a little more than just not being in the water part of the year. Like so many things, the perceptions that were raised by the pre-fountain hype just were too great for the, the result. Uh, the fountain itself is fine. It's a nice little fountain out in the middle of the river and it's, it's nice to drive by and see it. But we were told it was going to rival the Arch in St. Louis and the Eiffel Tower and certainly it doesn't rival any of those landmarks. Uh, and, and I think my ultimate view is that it was another embarrassment for Louisville. We, 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 <laughs> we said that we were going to have this world-renowned landmark, and, and it turns out to be a, a kind of a mini fountain. A mini fountain? It appears to be a white elephant. An embarrassment to Louisville? I think it was a waste no. of money, to tell you the truth. No. <laughs> what happened to slack-jawed amazement and great wonder of the world? Hey, why don't we all give a cheer for the fountain that they can hear on the other side of the river? Let's hear it for the fountain. Louisville is named for King Louis XVI of France. Most will tell you his reign ended poorly, what with the French Revolution and all. Still, our early settlers were very grateful for his support during the American Revolution. Today, when our leaders face civil unrest, they usually organize a committee. The mayor has appointed the Falls Fountain Committee to deal with criticism and perceived problems. After much debate and discussion, the committee has decided on a number of changes for the fountain. So we're hopeful with all these improvements that the new fountain will be very, very attractive and appealing. Uh-oh. In America, it's well known that when people talk about something being new and improved, then there really have been some problems. The Louisville Water Company is in charge of maintaining the fountain. A task it was assigned in 1987 when the fountain was still in the planning stages. So I had mixed emotions. I was glad that the, that the city had enough confidence in us and our abilities to ask us to do it, but I was very worried because uh, something like that could be a real career buster. Um, you know, the, when things go right, uh, you're just doing your job. When they go wrong, you've got big problems. There's that word again. But the fountain did have problems, almost immediately. We had the big startup ceremony on August the 19th, and then uh, the, uh, the next day we shut the fountain down to uh, continue the, the test out phases and the adjustments. And immediately the complaints began to pour in because people who didn't make it on August the 19th had wanted to see it uh, 
that next uh, Saturday and had wanted to see it over the weekend and expected it to run the following week. But because of the rush to get the fountain ready before Barry Bingham's death, there was still quite a bit of work to do on almost all the operating systems. The fountain had to be shut down a lot. Of course, they were never really sure whether it was off intentionally or it was off because of mechanical problems. And since the water company was ultimately taking responsibility for it, we, we suffered uh, some, of, some of an image problem or an image, uh, uh, and it wasn't image enhancing, I can tell you that. And things didn't get any better right away. In fact, 1989 was by far the worst year for the fountain in terms of maintenance. The river was unusually rough and full of debris, so the fountain's screening filters kept getting clogged. They had a hell of a time trying to work the bugs out. The fountain's anchoring system also caused a lot of problems. Things got so bad, the fountain came close to capsizing and sinking. Except for being hit by a barge, about everything bad that could happen did happen. But that was then. Since 1989, most of the problems have been worked out, and it's been pretty smooth sailing for the fountain's maintenance team. Unfortunately, the early problems seem to have severely damaged any hopes of wide-scale bonding between the public and the fountain. I always hear the word thing. You know, and that's interesting that you would hear that. And nobody calls it the fountain. And nobody calls it that in my circles. Nobody calls it uh, uh, the, the image or the symbol of Louisville. They call it the thing. <laughs> and so, I, 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 you know, I do hear that kind of response to it. Again, it's not the thing that's most talked about in my circles. But on the other hand, when it is, it's the thing. I don't think in terms of the popular imagination, whatever you regard, you regard the aesthetics of the fountain, uh, it, it hasn't yet caught the affection of the people. And uh, it could be that, you know, with enough tampering, with enough revision, uh, they'll, they'll get it right. But something hasn't yet happened where it has reached that stage. So we've got a predicament. Our landmark of the 80s, our community's logo, is taking hits from all sides. Funding is starting to be questioned. A person with a sense of history can't help but wonder, is the Falls Fountain going the way of the Derby clock? A lot of good people in my hometown. In fact, most of them are. Like any community, we've had our rough spots, but by and large, we get along, and we're eager to believe we live in a pretty good place. What it comes down to is, for the most part, there's not the smug cynicism you find in a lot of bigger, more sophisticated towns. We want to like things about our community. And even more so, we want people to like us, to like Louisville. But then something gets in our way. I don't know how many times I've heard, well, such and such is nice for Louisville. I mean, what does that mean, for Louisville? It's like saying that Louisville doesn't stand on its own. I mean, Louisville's fine, you know? Our leaders seem to recognize this tendency to be a bit unsure and critical about what we have here. Mr. Bingham probably would have understood the criticism directed at his gift. He was a very mature and understanding person, and I, I think he simply would have said, well, you know, that's the way people are. <laughs> But not everybody is criticizing the fountain. It's a funny thing. 
If people come down and spend some time looking at the fountain without thinking about whether it's world class or destined to do something great for Louisville, if they can put all that out of their mind, then they tend to like it. I love it. My son has told me that I need to come back at night and see it when the different colors are in there, so he's going to escort me back down to see it with the different colors in it. And it's interesting that people who have recently moved to Louisville tend to be more accepting of the fountain. Symbolically, it's a start. Well, more than symbolically, I think it is a start physically. I think it's a start toward recognizing the waterfront. I really like it. I think it's really wonderful in terms of it's a start. And when they see it at night, some really like it. If you see it at night, uh, it can be luminous. It can be almost mystical. There, there's something very powerful about seeing that, especially in a very dark night, and you see that uh, wonderful um, radiance that comes, especially in its, in its white mold. I've had visitors, writers from New York who've been here and said, you know, that's just stunning. And I, I feel that same way when I see it. And of course, enthusiasm remains strong among the leaders. I think it's a very important addition to the community. I think it's something that, that uh, like the Eiffel Tower, when it was uh, uh, put in in Paris, it had its, it had its uh, critics, it's had its people that were concerned about it, but uh, time uh, sort of wore those people down. And today, of course, the Eiffel Tower is one of the Paris's most famous uh, landmarks. I think the fountain has that potential if we support it. Eiffel Tower? Well, dreams of grandeur tend to die hard among leaders in my hometown. Maybe that's their way of compensating for second guessing by citizens. Still, this can make supporting the fountain a little tougher because, well, there are problems. Even boosters agree that changes are needed. Oh yes, the changes. Well, one big change is the base. Yes, that fountain base. Well, it, it had all the, you know, um, characteristics of a barge or um, utility vehicle that, that people had seen on the river. And not many of the um, um, sculptural or um, historical or symbolic qualities that fountains usually try to display. If there's anything that everyone agrees about the fountain, it's that its base is not its strong suit. It stands 13 feet high. It's blue, the blue of the Caribbean, a color the Ohio is usually not, unless there's been a spill of some sort. Unlike the fountain in Geneva, which has no base that's visible above the waterline, the fountain's base is very prominent, painfully prominent. So everyone agrees the base must go, except it can't go. It's got to be that far out of the water in order to make the spout go 400 feet in the air. So it was decided if it's going to be there, maybe there's some way to hide it. We're painting the base and we have Peter Bodner, who's an artist um, here in town, doing some Trump Foy, which means making something look like it isn't. <laughs> Fool the eye is a French way to pronounce that, uh, what that means. And uh, he's done some very interesting uh, models and studies and really researched this thoroughly. There's two forms of camouflage. One is the, the um, kind of disappear, the, the, the fade into the background um, type that's probably most recognized. And then another form is usually called dazzle camouflage where and it was employed uh, actually uh, in World War II with battleships um, where instead of trying to make something disappear, you confuse the issue. Peter Bodner is well known for his work with murals. Some say it would have been useful to get an artist involved with the fountain much earlier. But the whole problem is, in my opinion, that it was designed by engineers. And I don't think, to my knowledge, an artist was ever asked his opinion uh, about the design of the fountain and the placement of the fountain and so on. Uh, and it looked like it was designed by an engineer as opposed to an artist. Um, that was my first problem with it. So anyway, I thought the, 
we couldn't make it disappear. There were too many backgrounds, too many views um, of the subject, so that um, kind of the dazzle approach or making it look like something that it was not was most appropriate. So with the new paint job, the fountain is ready to take its familiar position on the Louisville waterfront, which brings us to the next change and another common complaint. But the river's goddamn big that here it is way out, or was, and still is, way out in the middle of this huge river, and you can't get close to it unless you're on a boat, and they won't let small boats get close to it anyway. Um, and so it, it just loses. It loses all the way around. But you can only bring it in so close due to river traffic and people not wanting a shower of river water whenever the wind is blowing in from the north. Still, the committee aims to please. Down at the foot of 4th Street is going to be the new location for the fountain, and the moorings and anchors are now in place, so when the fountain comes out of its dry dock position, it'll be moored directly to the new location, which brings it about 500 feet closer to shore and uh, closer to the bridge, about 900 feet, let's say about 1,000 feet closer to the bridge. So um, it's, we feel that the bridge will give it scale, and being closer in, people will enjoy it more. The fountain came on according to schedule, right at 8 a.m. It was not a publicized ceremony, and the media attention was not what it had been in 1988. Those that were on hand seemed to be pleased with what they saw. It's always a big first step when the work goes out into the world and, you know, um, has, has a life of its own, so to speak. You've uh, put into it, the, you know, the best that you can uh, muster and uh, the point at which it starts interacting with other people's lives and, and uh, concepts, uh, you just hope for the best. I would assume people are looking at it and trying to figure out what it is exactly, which I think is good. It'll be interesting to see what others make of the changes. The committee has more in mind if necessary. We also talked about the possibility, this might be uh, maybe next year, putting microphones on the fountain so people, when the Belvedere Connector is built, it would be a wonderful viewing area and people could listen to the water as well as see it. It's been more than a year since the major fountain changes were made. People don't seem to notice much. So far, no fountain sounds have been piped up to the Belvedere. People don't seem to mind this either. Actually, it's been a pretty quiet year for the fountain. Aside from a few adjustments in the way the spray hits the base, there hasn't been much going on. But there's been no shortage of activity on the waterfront. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Charles McCarty, chairman of the Waterfront Development Corporation. Thank you for joining us today to celebrate another milestone in Louisville's waterfront development story. Funds have been secured to construct the Belvedere Connector, which, just as you might imagine, will connect the Belvedere to the waterfront. Oh, the Belvedere is the public space that overlooks the interstate and the river. With the construction of this facility, the city will be reconnected to our waterfront, a connection that will only grow stronger with the implementation of a waterfront master plan. The connector signals the rebirth of the waterfront, and like proud parents, we have gathered here today, the family and friends, to celebrate. The fountain is not working at the moment. There was a heavy electrical storm yesterday, and a few kinks in the fountain's computer program needed to be ironed out. But no one seems to notice, which might be a good sign. It seems people just aren't paying as much attention to the fountain these days. Some people would say it's about time things were put in perspective. Since there is no waterfront in, ter in terms of yet a great lawn or a shorefront or apartments or walkways or you know anything like that, um, all the focus gets put on this one poor little fountain. 
<laughs> and uh, people are just pummeling the thing to death about how it's not, I think that subconsciously people look at it like, oh, that's supposed to be the answer, you know, like this one fountain, <laughs> there they did it, look at it, it's not fabulous. Well, you know, perhaps in the context of an entire developed waterfront, the fountain would be wonderful. So, uh, you know, I, I just think it, 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 the perspective becomes very warped. Part of the warped perspective is the notion that the fountain still doesn't work very well. Actually, it works just fine these days. Its functions are monitored by a computer located at the water company. Every other day, a technician does an on-site inspection. Then, once a month, the fountain is shut down for about four hours in order to do more intensive maintenance. The Louisville Falls Fountain is a marvel of engineering. Built in 1988 by the Saradino Company of Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Falls Fountain graces the waterfront of Louisville, Kentucky. The Louisville Falls Fountain, or the Fountain as it is affectionately known by Louisvillians, is the most powerful floating fountain in the world. Its center nozzle is capable of propelling a stream of Ohio River water 435 feet in the air. That's roughly the same height as the world-renowned Humana Building in downtown Louisville. The fountain weighs 10,959 pounds, and there's 532 square feet of floor area inside. Not enough for most families, but certainly enough for a crew of hard-working engineers. The fountain gets its water through a set of screens that ingeniously filter out debris, which otherwise could clog the nozzles. We wouldn't want that, as the center nozzle alone costs $80,000. In the course of just a minute, the fountain's sprayers can shoot out 15,800 gallons of water. That could fill a lot of swimming pools in a hurry. The muscle of the fountain can be seen in its powerful pumping units. The main one has 900 horsepower. That's as much as all the horses in the last 60 Kentucky Derbies. The brain of the Falls Fountain is a computer that controls its intricate program of lights and aquatic hygiene. The computer can be controlled either on board or from a special control room at the Louisville Water Company. The fountain is in operation from May to November. Its daily hours are 8 a.m. to midnight. Since its opening in 1988, the Louisville Falls Fountain has rarely missed a day of work. It is truly a mechanical marvel. So the truth be known, the fountain is a mechanical marvel. And these days it's operating just as it was designed to. But at what cost? The expense of the fountain has long been a concern to some people. Well, the fountain doesn't, the fountain doesn't bother me. <laughs> but like a lot of other people, I get, you know, people see things like that and they think, gee, that money could have been spent some way that would have helped people more than a fountain in the river. You know, that was private money. Uh, although I guess people have pointed out over the years it'll be public money that keeps it up, I think. I think that's right about that. The annual maintenance cost for the fountain is right at about $130,000. That covers electricity, maintenance, storage, and moving it. These expenses are covered by the Louisville Water Company, which is owned by the city of Louisville. You may not have been able to feed, clothe, and shelter everybody. But if you think about the dollars that were put into that fountain, that they had been put into the community, in areas where people really need it the most, I feel as though that it will be more beneficial than water shooting up in the air on the Ohio River. The water company pays its fountain expenses from funds that would otherwise be directed to the city of Louisville's treasury. So in essence, the citizens of Louisville are paying for the fountain. But I, I do hear a lot about the money end of it. People say, well, that's a lot of money to put, on, put into a fountain. They could have put that money into something else. 
that would have been more representative of the total community. That fountain only represents a segment of the community that really is not, it really makes the decisions, but certainly don't rub shoulders with all of us. The population of the city of Louisville is roughly 260,000. So that means each man, woman, and child in the city is paying about 50 cents a year to keep the fountain afloat. I'm not sure, but I guess that means the people in southern Indiana are getting it for free. You know, I think the Louisville is wonderfully generous about social needs and the, particularly the arts. And uh, uh, when some things are as, uh, as serious and as bad as the homeless problem, uh, generous people think, well, I, you know, the fountain's lovely, but we don't really need, we need to do something about these important things that are going wrong here. So, I mean, I, I understand that. I think that's very, uh, very creditable. The fountain's original cost in early maintenance was paid for by a bequest from Mary and Barry Bingham Sr. This was a total of some $2.6 million. That is a fair amount of money. But as of June 1, 1993, the Mary and Barry Bingham Sr. Fund had contributed $57,000,000 $694,160.08 to various causes besides the Falls Fountain. It's safe to say that after all the promotion, all the criticism, all the improvements, all the money spent, the fountain still has an uncertain place in my hometown. You've got to wonder why. I think Part of our national problem and local problem now is that we're in an age where we're so self-critical and so self-conscious that we're, our monitors are always on thinking about what does this mean, what does it mean when we say that it means this, um, deconstructing, reconstructing everything. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult time to come up with symbols and to uh, try to create new symbols, which in fact what we do with the fountain. Could be, but the way other communities react to landmarks is worth thinking about. The city of Philadelphia, for example, has more than its share of world-class, or at least national-class, landmarks. It's interesting to consider what happened when they added a clothespin to their skyline. It's enormous. It's huge. It's, I, I mean, I'm not good on heights, but I guess it's about, you know, it's, it's as high as a two-story building. It's, it's very big. And it's this wonderfully sensual, just I mean, the shape of it is, is really fabulous. And um, people just complained and laughed and said, I can't believe the city spent that much on this, you know, clothespin and, you know, oh, please. She doesn't say how the clothespin was promoted, but it seems like Philadelphians reacted pretty much like the people of Louisville did when the fountain had problems. Well, at first, anyway. And then what happened was People began to take ownership. You know, the citizens of the city kind of said, that's my clothespin. You know, it seems that when it's all said and done, one of the few things you can say for certain about the fountain is that the people of Louisville have not stepped forward to say, that's my fountain, just yet. Maybe we're just a tough audience, or maybe it's something else. I think that uh, when you, you touch the fountain, you're also touching Louisville's psychological profile as well as something physical and symbolic. And if you will, we're, in, in a way, when you look at the fountain, you're looking at Louisville's metaphysics and you're looking at its um, landscape and you're also looking at its psychology. And uh, there's, there's something about the, the, the city that has that sense of ambivalence about itself, uh, borderline, not quite north, not quite south. Uh, not quite large in the massive sense, not quite small. Uh, and I, I find Louisvillians to have a, uh, what I, I consider a withering sense of um, uh, an inferiority complex. And then again, maybe we're just making too big a deal out of all this. Because here we are, almost in the 21st century, and life goes on in my hometown. Dan Ulmer? He retired from his bank not long ago. Most of the local banks are being merged with big brothers from out of state. Dan says he plans to focus more energy on civic projects, like the regional class aquarium he tried to bring to the riverfront. 
Our airport is almost through with its expansion. Now we're going to have parallel runways, and we'll be able to handle a lot more air traffic. It should be good for business. Remember Vernon Eldridge? He's the South Ender who wasn't too impressed with the fountain. Well, I'm sorry to say his health has been poor. To make matters worse, he's had to move from the neighborhood where he'd lived for 52 years. When the airport expanded, his home and others were in the way. The prospects are looking bright for the University of Louisville getting its new football stadium. Should seat about 55,000. The coach says it's what we need if we expect to win a national championship. Amanda Miller had twins not so long ago. She still works as an art consultant. Primarily, she helps businesses decorate their offices in an appropriate manner. The Parkland Area Business Association is excited about the plans for 28th and Dumanil. Their goal is to revitalize the business district that was destroyed in the 1968 riots. Barney Bright is working on a variety of projects. He'd like to see the day when the Derby clock is brought out of storage. Maybe it could go on one of the malls out in the east end of town. They're expanding again. Several national class department stores are set to open outlets in the spring. They will be welcome. Jeff Ellis still works for the county judge. On the weekends, he's pastored to a small congregation at St. John's AME Church. Mary Bingham still comes to her office most weekdays. The foundation she and her husband created continues to give millions of dollars to community causes every year. Most people appreciate it, but we're like any other town. There always seems to be more need than money. They say we're going to have a new bridge soon. Now we're trying to decide where it should go. The consultants are having a field day. In spite of them, I'm sure we'll work something out. Things usually turn out okay in my hometown. People say it's comfortable here, which is saying a lot when you stop and think about it. Maybe someday we will, but you never know. You see, my hometown is a river town. At least that's how it all started.